So uh, Ernestina Asoria teaches courses on the history and theory of architecture, art, and visual culture. She completed her PhD in the history and theory of architecture at Princeton University after finishing her undergraduate studies with distinction in art history and Spanish literature at UC Santa Barbara. She also earned a professional degree in architecture at UCLA and a was a practicing architecture and uh, urban designer. Her writing focuses on Mexico and studies architecture's relation to cultural memory, visual culture, media, and urbanism. Uh, her interests have been augmented by migration and travel experiences and the notion of constructed boundaries in the landscape and horizon. Her work explores built environments in Latin America and their diverse influences and tendencies from indigenous knowledge, knowledge systems, the effects of ideological and technological developments, the dissemination of architectural ideas across geographical and theoretical terrains. Uh, this presentation that she'll be giving this evening or this afternoon, depending where you are, is part of an interdisciplinary project that examines the transnational and intercultural provocations, exchange, reception, and representation of Mexican architectural modernisms and the intellectual genealogies that shape them. Um, Osorio discusses how a convergence of architecture, art, photography, traditional arts, and anthropology in the early to mid 20th century represented attempts within these areas to highlight the inextricable link between indigenous knowledge and modernisms in Mexico. Um, we're very excited to have Tina um, speaking with us this afternoon. Her uh, interests are extremely important and topical and have become a part, a part of our uh, educational work here at Cal Poly. So we're really excited to have her. Tina? Um, here is Tina, I know you're there. Can you speak? Are you muted? Yeah, I was just. I was you're talking. muted. All right. Yeah. All you talking. and then um, share your screen when you're ready. And, I will. Uh, we'll run a QA um, at the end. So awesome. thank you, everybody. I was just thanking you and um, Angela for your support of this lecture series. And thank you for the invitation. Okay. Hold on. I'm just uh, toggling. I only have one screen. So I'm just toggling between this and PowerPoint. All right. All right, here we go. Sorry. Okay. Let's see if I can share it the way I want to share it. Are you able to see my slides? Can you hear me? Can hear you definitely. Uh, can't see the slides yet. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's try that. All right, now can you see the slide? Awesome. Okay, thank you. So thanks again, Stephen, for the invitation. Really, this talk could be retitled um, an I Love Mexico Transnational Women's Tour of the Early 20th Century. That's another way of looking at it. So, you know, independent interdependence and the construction of this Mexican modernist discourse or really um, how this group of women um, banded together to um, promote the idea of Mexican modernism. So in today's talk, I'll present some ideas at on, on the cross-border exchanges in Mexican modernism that occurred during a roughly 50 year period that began at the end of the Mexican revolution in 1920. So these, these ideas draw from my own research and also um, from the, the courses that I teach on modern Mexican visual culture and architecture. So this narrative, I'm talking about a narrative of transnational discourse that draws from an understanding of Mexican modernism 
and also from an understanding of the role of women in the introduction of modern architecture through the communication of modernist ideas and through their transmission through various media. So this narrative is multidisciplinary in its nature and it draws from a number of fields, um, diverse fields in architecture, ar architectural history and theory, uh, a broad range of the design fields, um, uh, landscape design, as well as using the related tools of photography, um, literature, um, publishing, journalism, and anthropology. So in consideration of the Mexican United States borderlands, um, I'd like to draw our attention to their intrinsic nature, which is fluid and intermixing. And the examples that I'll present highlight how a group of women from Mexico, the United States and Italy crossed and recrossed, just crisscrossed this region of the borderlands and made Mexican modernism possible in a way. So I'll present these examples, some case studies that also demonstrate the, the potent positive effects of depoliticized exchanges and, and which serve as models for contemporary architectural, artistic and planning practice. Um, so we're looking at um, the work and experiences of three, three um, women from the United States. That's Frances Tour, Esther Bourne, and Esther McCoy. So Frances Tour was a publisher and a, a, like a Mexico enthusiast. Um, Esther Bourne was an architect and photographer, and, and um, Esther McCoy was also an architect and, uh, and a, a writer a critic, really. We're looking also, we're considering one Mexican, Anita Brenner, also, um, she was named Hannah Brenner, and one Italian, Tina Modotti. So Anita Brenner was uh, a, a journalist. Um, she was trained as an anthropologist under Francis, Franz, Franz Boas at Columbia. Um, she was the official um, reporter in Latin America for the Jewish Telegraph Agency. She was a reporter for um, The Nation. Um, and, and again, and, and the last one is um, Tina Modotti, an Italian photographer um, um, and, and former actress. So the work and, and the experiences of these figures provide the framework of my discussion today on the circulation of architectural ideas um, from the, again, the 1920s through the 1960s that reflect a desire to create a standardized modern architecture, if you will, and a desire and, and also that that reflected a that one one that respond would respond specifically to uniquely Mexican urban and rural concerns of of access to education, access to health and economic opportunity following um, the, this first, that, that um, stage of the, of the Mexican revolution. So these are themes that revolve as much around the home and, and the family traditionally associated with women as, as with as the, 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 the public realm itself. So these women recognized architecture and an arts representation of cultural and social relationships and their ability to enable new relationships. So it, it, it deepens our understanding of, of one's agency in this context. In this context. So um, it, it, it um, deepens our understanding of these women's, these women's um, works efficacy in different cultural arenas and and also deepens our understanding of women during this period as agents of transformation in, um, in various environments. Um, so let's see, I'll put, sorry about that. <laughs> Let me just turn this down. Sorry about that. Oh. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. 
So my discussion, this is a really simple event, but I couldn't help myself because I really don't have access to um, uh, diagramming in a much more sophisticated manner. So this discussion addresses some key, some key questions in our study of modern Mexican architecture. So in Mexico, funcionalismo, which is the term that refers to modern architecture, funcionalismo is at the intersection of, um, well, funcionalismo is like modernism. Um, it's a, the intersection of um, modern architecture, um, Mexican culture and, it, and its diverse expressions. Um, domesticity, as well as um, technology. So when I refer to domesticity, I'm referring to houses, housing, and the private realm of um, families and, and social connections. And women, <clears throat> were, um, these women were the messengers of funcionalismo, really. That's what I'm sketching out. So they were the messengers, uh, the sort of um, messengers in, in various uh, formats, platforms, um, and, and, and the different ways that they were messengers affected modernism's representation and its reception in Mexico and abroad, particularly the United States. And I will note that um, in my talk, I will be referring to the United States as the United States rather than as America. So um, I just want to make that clear because America, United States is just one among many countries um, within America. So um, it might sound a little awkward, but it's just, um, uh, just part of the, uh, the, the language that I want to use to make those distinctions. Okay, so the content and discourse of funcionalismo by these women represents a, a, a significant paradigm shift in Mexican architecture after the revolution. So this paradigm shift is exemplified by um, the contrast to the work of, of Guillermo Calo, um, Frida Calo's father. So uh, he was a professional turn of the century photographer who was hired in 1904 to catalog existing colonial, primarily religious architecture in and around Mexico City. This was a project that was uh, planned in anticipation of the centennial of Mexican independence. Um, and this was, and it's also worth noting that this was uh, a project that was planned and arranged um, during the um, so-called reign or rule of Porfirio Diaz, who um, governed um, in a somewhat um, autocratic manner for decades leading up to uh, the agrarian revolt known as the Mexican Revolution. So this massive work uh, features static images of, of the required monumental, largely colonial buildings, as well as some cultural and, and civic monuments, as you see in this example, the, uh, the image of the Church of La Soledad from 1904, from that year. And the subject matter of Carlos work, even in perspective, focuses, you know, emphasizes these monumental buildings, um, the church detail um, in the foreground, um, even when they're contextualized by their surroundings. Um, for example, the Avenida Madero, uh, which is a street in the historic core of Mexico City uh, off of the central um, massive Socalo, um, massive square, public square. And here's just another example that, you know, that does the same thing. Uh, from the same year. So in contrast to Carlos sort of um, visualization um, as images of, of, of colonial structures, the imagined perspective of funcionalismo here presented by the architect and the artist Juan O'Gorman represents a complete, again, a, a, a complete paradigm shift in, in the thinking of the new Mexican architecture, what was then sort of um, coined as a new Mexican architecture. So the focus uh, was then on construction, on, on, on skyscrapers, um, housing and pre-Columbian motifs and on workers who um, notably were depicted, you know, was, is depicted here um, as, uh, as likely a mestizo or an indigenous 
um, person. So Mestizo is one from a mixed European and indigenous background, those of you not, not familiar. So, so what I'm, so that's sort of the backdrop for um, this endeavor to sort of, sort of introduce a new Mexico following the revolution in architectural terms. So while women uh, were, these women were key in, in promoting the acceptance of modern architecture in Mexico and abroad, you know, the, we, we don't know a lot um, in terms of um, their collective works and commentary. Um, so as writers, as patrons, as photographers, collectively they, they promoted, they successfully promoted Mexican architecture in, in, in the mid in, in the mid 20th century. And, and they occupied some key roles, some central roles in, in travel literature and the popularization of Mexican culture to non-Mexican audiences. So their ability to, to successfully bridge the cultural divide, um, it speaks as much to their, um, to their sort of, um, their effectiveness in transmitting this empathic sort of romantic image of the other um, and as to their as to their interests in folkloric traditional indigenous subjects um, so many of which revolve around women in Mexican culture so I'll just point out um, the publication of a number of um, a number of, of like lullabies songs for instance that are passed down in the home so these women paid attention to the entirety of modernism, um, in, including um, domestic places, schools. And, and so they were I mean, initially locations, not in Mexico, not in the sort of lens of grandeur um, in a profession that was dominated by men. So their significance and the, the success of Funcionalismo is partly due to strategic marketing and, and publicity campaigns on the part of these women and Tolteca magazine, which I'll get to shortly, and also national, transnational efforts on their part working both in, in Mexico and the US. So case in point, um, here are Frances Tor on my left and Anita Brenner um, seeking out um, you know, knowledge of of some of these um, in, uh, knowledge of the of the indigenous um, heritage, um, and and in a way also you know um, trying to um, make it accessible, bring it to um, to more people in in an, an accessible format. So Francis Tor, as I mentioned, in, um, uh, uh, a Mexico enthusiast, a, pu a publisher was an American expatriate um, who actually taught Spanish language courses here in LA where I'm located. Um, and she was inspired by the arts in Mexico, particularly um, indigenous arts, um, uh, traditional arts, folk, what's often called folklore, folk, folk arts, um, so folkloric um, arts. And and she subsequently made a permanent mark on um, the cultural life um, among uh, this community that she was, um, community, this audience and a community in, in Mexico in the arts. Um, and, and that was a result of publishing and editing a, pop, a, a popular bilingual Spanish and English tourists magazine. Uh, Mexican Folkways, and also she published a, 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 a related popular guidebook. So Anita Brenner, um, also seen here um, in this image, visiting the, the Posteco ruins in the state of Morelos, which is just south of Mexico City, uh, where the city of Cuernavaca is looking, located. Was, so Anita Brenner was, again, um, uh, well, actually, I didn't mention it. She, but she, she was a journalist. But she was—I I mentioned that she's Mexi She was Mexican. She um, trained, as I mentioned, in anthropology. She was a student of Franz Boas, and, um, and she was a self-taught journalist. I should point out, 
whose contemporary and um, at that time late works popularized um, Mexican culture and the history of the revolution. And so she's noted really best known for um, writing Idols Behind Altars, which was one of the first um, comprehensive studies of um, Mexican arts written for um, an English speaking audience, read, reading audience and also wrote The Wind That Swept Mexico, which looked at the connections between um, the arts and in all of their expansiveness and um, the, the, the legacy really the, of the revolution, re revolutionary ideals. So again, Tor, I mentioned, um, and Brenner, um, each separately produced um, guidebooks. So Tours um, Guide to Mexico uh, from 1933 and um, Brenner's Your Mexican Holiday uh, from the, the previous year. So these introduced Funcionalismo to you know, non-Mexicans and contextualized Funcionalismo in relation to Mexico's culture, politics, people and the arts. So the collect, the, their collective works, um, those of Tor and Brenner became resources for uh, tourists, of course, um, but also anthropologists, artists, architects, writers and art collectors. So Tor's Mexican folkways that I mentioned was again, a bilingual publication that was intended largely for a recreational um, sort of intellectual audience interested in art. Um, and it featured indigenous culture and arts in particular, which at the time um, were important features of a broad nationalist resurgence. So Tor uses architecture to highlight culture and, and the arts in Mexican folkways. And the, the publication featured contributions from well-known artists, writers, uh, and intellectuals like Diego Rivera, who designed this cover. Um, you could see his uh, initials here um, and who was the magazine's art editor in 1926, um, included contributions from Tina Modotti, Carlos Merida, Manuel Alvarez Bravo, Edward Weston, um, Javier Via Urrutia and also the um, Alfonso, Alfonso Caso. So it was a vehicle to realize revolutionary ideals through art. And it was published in Mexico City between 1925 and 1937. And, and Tor um, created the magazine, she published it. And um, in, in this way, she promoted the so-called traditional culture of, of Mexico. So those from the United States traveling to Mexico were not just reporting. Mexican Folkways wasn't simply a tourist magazine. It created a, a framework for introducing and reintroducing nationalism and indigenous culture that became massively adopted in later building projects. So here's another uh, cover designed by Rivera, which of course, features um, an, an, an emphasis on in indigenous culture, indigenous knowledge. So the inclusion and popularization of frescoes and their placement in new buildings was a uniquely Mexican expression of modernism. So in her 1932 um, Mexican Folkways article, New Schools and More Frescoes, Nuevas Escuelas y Más Frescos, um, Tour identifies some key innovations in the construction of 32 rural public schools and promotes modern architecture's integration of art in this endeavor. So Tor notes that, that the artist Pablo O'Higgins's frescoes in a new, in a new primary school and, and the structure itself, um, an example of modern architecture that was also designed by Juan O'Gorman, um, are, are worth seeing um, and considered equally significant 
um, for the tourist, right? So the, the architecture and the art, in other words, the, uh, the ornamental um, program were on the same level and, and also um, were as significant as other um, examples of, of arts published in the magazine. So while consistent with the, the modernist um, disdain of ornamentation, again, the schools were decorated with frescoes um, that were completed by, you know, by artists that, um, that specialized in this medium, they were interested in it. And the government's dual goals, the federal government's dual goals were to advance the use of the medium and to employ more artists in the projects. So besides serving nationalist uh, governmental objectives of, of visually educating uh, students, um, you know, these are rural schools. So it was um, in many cases, largely um, indigenous students. Um, the frescoes were also to comment on the relationship between art and architecture. So frescoes, unlike sculpt sculptural or ornamentation, were to be understood as part of the wall. So art and this, this, you know, this, um, uh, this discussion of the, the integration of the arts, right? Art and harmony with, uh, with, with architecture. So although brief, most of Tor's descriptions of modern architecture in her guidebook are paired with those on art, which, which indicates their, their critical connections and, and equal significance. Um, so for example, her discussion of Carlos Obregón Santa Cilia's 1929 Ministry of Health and Assistance building also highlights Diego Rivera's um, frescoes and stained glass windows ornamental design. And these are taken from that book. And in contrast to Francis Tor's emphasis on art and culture, Tina Modotti emphasizes uh, modernist structures, materiality, and, and the details that comprise them. So again, um, the Ministry of Health which and, and Assistance, which draws our attention to the building's construction details and um, the tangible qualities of the materials. Um, so while most of Modotti's images of the built environment were not featured in Mexican folkways, um, they share key traits with the included images. So Tor points out uh, the photo's expression of quote, significant phenomena of everyday life uh, with their implied social significance, as well as uh, Modotti's objectivity, um, her technical mastery and um, empathic representation of the people um, and, and details. Not, not that these two indicate that, but and others. But let me just go back really quick, really quickly, just to point out something and then go forward, I'm trying to move quickly. Um, I just wanted to point out that this Ogorman school was photographed by, by Manuel Alvarez Bravo, just to um, uh, just again note, you know, who, 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 who uh, comprised the staff. Okay, so Modotti published a critique of an art-centric reading of photography as part of her attempt to um, sort of balance the social and individual expression. And, and this contributes to the works, to her works um, forcefulness and, and it actually distinguishes, it, it distinguishes itself from that of some of her contemporaries like, uh, like Weston or um, Alvarez Bravo. So uh, this is just um, a portrait of her by Weston, um, um, who she, who was her lover in, in Mexico. And um, these are some ads of her, of, that were published in Mexican folkway. So initially it's, you know, it, it indicates the collaboration between Weston and Modotti um, and their studio that's located in uh, Avenida Veracruz in the Condesa neighborhood. And this is the um, ad that then, um, you know, indicates her, her individual, um, her individual practice in different location. Okay. So, so as she was actually the, the official photo editor 
um, as of the of the magazine of Mexican folkways. Um, and in in this capacity, Molotti's strength was her ability to identify and and visually express in subject matter and um, emotional content post revolutionary political, economic, um, social, and also cultural concerns. Okay. Um, so just a second. Um, yeah, I just realized I removed something. Oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> I was gonna talk a little bit about this dialectic that, um, that um, this group was um, engaging between you know, at once a Spanish and English um, uh, readership and um, uh, the revolution and education, marketing and materials and so on, art and architecture. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the publisher, the photographer, the artist and architect um, and the various uh, um, members of staff. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about this notion of publicizing um, a, technolo a technological revolution um, Cemento Stolteca that I mentioned um, earlier, the premier was the, was the premier pr producer, manufacturer of the building materials used in the architecture of the so-called New Mexico. Um, and it produced um, a magazine <laughs> to promote its product of the same name. So it so Tolteca, the magazine defined funcionalismo in Mexico during the 20s and 30s while promoting its product. So it was very um, sort of, uh, you know, focused in that in, in its scope in that way. Um, so, you know, promoting building materials to a generation of architects, a new generation of architects, then designing and creating um, modernist architecture, part of this new um, new um, Mexico that uh, that um, we'll see is is coined by Esther Bourne. So Anita Brenner recognized the importance of of Tolteca, both the company and its magazine, and presciently reported on how this pro-modern company was transforming Mexican architecture. So Brenner wrote about Toteca's art contests um, and, and the magazine's features on art, aesthetics, architecture, and engineering. So those, that's what she identified. Um, con the, the, the contests that were conducted to, you know, competitions that were conducted to promote the understanding and the use of modern materials, particularly reinforced concrete. So 20 years later, Esther McCoy, uh, who I'll discuss shortly, would reiterate and confirm what Brenner had initially noted that Cemento Tolteca was the springboard for modern for modernism. And as a contemporary critic, Brenner lacked the ad advantage of historical perspective, though her observations were validated subsequently by McCoy. Okay. So in 1935, uh, the photographer and the architect Esther Bourne embarked on a road trip from New York City, where she was living at the time, uh, where she learned photography, to, to Mexico City. And she um, she took with her um, an address book that included um, the names of contacts like um, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, the architects, Juan O'Gorma and Luis Barragan. And, and during her months, um, several months long visit in Mexico, Bourne took some 300 photographs that cataloged the architecture and, and the visual culture of the New Mexico um, for architects from uh, to, for, 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 for architects from these two from the United States and Mexico. So after returning from Mexico, the April 1937 architectural record issue featured her phot photographs in the new architecture in, in Mexico. Um, and a book of that title was published in the same year. 
so Bourne's work was acknowledged in the August 1937 issue of House and Garden in a, in a piece that was called Modern in Mexico. And, and a few of her photographs were also published in another um, uh, magazine called Shelter that was kind of short-lived a couple of years later. So the feature articles and the, and the book um, were written for an English speaking, largely United States, United States art audience. So their images attempt to legitimate the, the you know, a, a simul simultaneous desire for um, um, sort of interest, un interest in otherness and also an interest in the familiar in Mexico. So for Born, photographs of Mexican modernism demonstrated Mexicans equal interest in, in uh, you know, the new architecture developing in the United States, um, while also commenting on this traditional modern dialectic. So as a trained architect, um, Bourne brought a, a discriminating eye to her photos. Um, um, and she recognized the critical details of funcionalismo in practice. Um, she was actually uh, trained, she was actually she received her architecture degree at Cal. Okay, so in comparing um, pre-Columbian and modernist architecture, Bourne juxtaposed, juxtaposed the ancient Cuicuilco pyramid in Southern Mexico City uh, and, and a sketch of a Corbusian building that draws parallels between their horizontal lines and their stepped massing. So this comparison modifies a conventional tendency to formulate modern themes that are based on ancient constructs, um, such as contemporary buildings mimicking Aztec architecture, for instance, as one well-known example. And instead it underscores, it, it suggests how the ancient, um, you know, it, it predicts the modern. So by suggesting that revolutionary forms had been in place in, in Mexico long before the emergence of Le Corbusier, Bourne presents a source of inspiration for Corbusier's um, Mexican proponents and, and provides a context for later modernist forms that recall pre-Columbian constructs. So Bourne recognized how Le Corbusier's elements in, in and style thrown, you know, shown through, you know, his Ozan font house and studio pictured here, the interior and the exterior. She recognized how that, you know, was echoed, how they were echoed in the work of Juan Ogorman in his design and construction of the Casa Estudio of Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. So this is um, the Casa Estudio and, and from another um, vantage point. And this is the house that Ogorman designed for his father, Cecil Ogorman. So note that these same modernist features um, photographed by Bourne were, were not recognized or emphasized by Guillermo Calo in his, in his photo, photos of the same structures. Um, these were actually the first photographs taken of this project. And, the, and, and this is actually a photo studio that was, that was built for Guillermo Calo. So the distinction is that Born, um, you know, again, she, she was a trained architect and she was a modernist and, and Calo obviously was not. So Esther Born befriended um, Francis Tour and, and documented her home. So I mentioned they both had this, um, this California um, uh, connection. And so although Francis Tour focused on the preservation of traditional folklore um, in the face of modernization, not just um, the visual, not just uh, indigenous arts, but folklore more ex um, expansively. In 1932, Tour also commissioned Juan Ogorman to design a modernist house studio for her. So the design optimize this, the site's limited space um, by placing parking space under the three um, live, living and working levels. 
and those areas. And, the, and so Tor occupied um, the top two floors of the building and the gallery was on um, the uppermost floor and her living and workspace were on the second floor and two rental units were on the first floor. Um, and the building again was raised above um, parking and um, uh, a service space for domestic um, staff, domestic workers on the ground floor as well. And this is just a quick glance at the, the plant. So as the drawings in, in Bourne's book indicate, um, you know, this, this design, this building's design was largely driven by the needs of Francis Tours Studios. So Bourne's photographs document a modernist house that's steeped in traditional folkloric interior decoration. And of Esther Bourne's published photographs of the Tour residence, the interior view, which you see here, um, features a semi-public living room, which would be professional in appearance for her, uh, for her business. And so, um, you know, we see that this is a room in a modernist house, um, you know, interior and exterior that's adorned with um, traditional folkloric items, you know, the, the pottery, the textiles, um, um, the woven items, etc. And Bourne's description of the room is of a quote, a business place at once adequate and informal, um, and, and her image captures this, this room that's you know, filled with light that enters from this, um, this band, which you can see here in the unpublished um, wider view of steel frame windows that, you know, span the edges of the, the photograph. And, and um, sorry, I think, okay, just sorry, I wasn't sure what that was, I heard a noise. So um, we also see how, you know, she composes this, this this image um, with the table and um, the, the, the prominent window band that frame a sofa and, and sort of, and, and use these crumpled cushions to soften the metal stiffness of the structure um, that subdues and also subdues the overpowering light that floods this, um, this seemingly intimate room. Um, Okay, so while the, pa the, the pages of Mexican folkways, again, were covered with images of folkloric objects, this, this photograph implies a conscious acknowledgement of the intersection of um, uh, sort of nostalgic and traditional imagery, um, in some cases of the past, and you know, the imminent presence of modernity of um, technological um, change. So curiously, the, the photograph minimizes the value of these objects inside the office and equates um, business with, with the metal window, the, the window frame um, from the outside. And in contrast to the openness of the living room, Bourne's photograph of the interior of Tour Studio presents a rather enclosed private working space. Um, and the three walls of one of Tours' several studios um, create a darkness that encloses another table. Um, so unlike the one that's represented in the first photograph, um, of course, magazines are conspicuously placed on these surfaces as um, a number, she, would she would have to um, present these works to uh, clients, etc. And in this photograph, the viewer can observe how the privacy of the studio is meant to complement towards functional professional needs in contrast to the more public open nature of the living room. So again, note the presence of folkloric, traditional um, indigenous items um, and, and subject matter in, in, in the paintings and other works. So in an unpublished review of Bourne's The New Architecture of Mexico for the Nation, Anita Brenner notes that modern low-cost housing had been more successful in Mexico than she noted anywhere on the American continent. So again, 
Brenner notes, uh, attributes, attributes this to the, um, which she considered partly accidental role of Cementos Tolteca's marketing campaigns. And it's also significant that as Brenner observes, Mexican architects flexibly, flexibly adapted funcionalismo, functionalism to, to Mexican needs and, and tastes. Okay, so um, again, she's writing in English for the nation. Um, modernism in Mexico would almost necessarily have to distinguish itself from its uh, European and North and, North and um, United States counterparts. So this culturally, ex culturally specific expression of strict functionalism, funcionalismo, would only later be critically acknowledged as authentically modernist, as we all know. So unique, unique technical and, and social conditions were, were conducive to the development of modernism, specifically modern housing in Mexico, which, which Brenner noted. Um, and, and she credits Bourne's ability as a scholar, technician, and reporter to completely, to competently and completely tackle the task of presenting this narrative. Um, and, and this draws a parallel, she, she actually draws a parallel between um, the fresh and, and Spartan qualities of modern architecture and, and the book's clarity of pre presentation. So here are two, two of Esther Bourne's photographs of post-World War I uh, European inspired um, uh, low income and workers housing projects. So she photographed um, Juan Legareta's um, projects in, in two different neighborhoods, the San Jacinto and the Balbuena developments in Mexico City. Okay. So after World War II, and the, the critic, the architectural critic es Esther McCoy took up the transnational discourse on, on modern Mexican architecture and culture where Tor, Brenner, Modotti, and Bourne had left off prior to the war. Uh, and she chronicled her visits in three um, issues for Arts and Architecture um, magazine and one in Zodiac between 1951 and 1964. So during her, her visits to Mexico City, McCoy developed friendships with some of Mexico's best known architects. I've mentioned O'Gorman and, and Barragan, but there were plenty others. And, and they were sustained by later exchanges of correspondence of publishing a number of lectures and, and exhibitions. So the theme, this theme of um, social engagement of friendship cuts across her genres and media into her vast, um, personal slash professional correspondence that provides a vehicle by which to access an, another space to transmit and exchange ideas. So in contrast to post-war discourse that highlighted the scale of the city uh, of city planning and advertising and, and media techniques, um, this type of cultural exchange paid even more attention to the implications of, um, of more intimate spaces um, like, uh, like homes, for example, and um, the implication in, in, the, in, in, in this, again, in this uh, modern context for modernity. So McCoy's role in the cultural exchange of architectural ideas between the United States and, and Mexico functions not only in response to, to technological developments um, and increased mutual awareness of current theoretical and design practices, but in, in underlining the complexity of modernist discourse itself during this period. So her travels to Mexico affected arts and architectures, questioning a representation of architectural practice and O'Gorman's career, um, reaffirming his, his distance from an earlier functionalist vocabulary and, and away from uh, predominant contemporary uh, modernist positions. So in an early 1960s letter to McCoy, Helen O'Gorman 
writing on behalf of her husband, wrote of her, uh, wrote of her frustration with the American embassy. She wrote, these officials certainly are gifted in the art of alienating all the Latin Americans they can. They seem to have no understanding, but none of the Latin American intellectual or any intellectual for that matter. Okay, so that's the end of the quote. So besides being an, an architectural critic, um, McCoy acted, she, she operated at some capacity as an ambassador of Latin American culture and its, uh, its producers. So in the August 1951 Arts and Architecture issue, McCoy wrote of a second modern architecture wa wave that was uh, designed by a new generation of young Mexico City-based architects. So her evaluation of modernism is a function of house design. Um, all houses, McCoy wrote, are required to be of contemporary design. The style known as California colonial is expressly forbidden. And, and this, this cover image features some of you might know, might recognize it. It's, um, it's an outdoor space in, the, in, Luis Barag in Luis Barragan's house, which I'm like using as my backdrop. Okay. And McCoy's assessment of the Mexican house not only critiques his historical revivalism while exalting the what were like so-called native, native qualities of vernacular architecture, but also employ it also implies that there's there's an affinity between the country's vernacular architecture and modernism, um, the land and and modernism, the actual um, uh, you know topography and geography, thus promoting modern architecture. So for McCoy, the Mexican vernacular house is the only true, truly native style. Um, and, and, and it's not to be confused with the highly ornamented turn of the century Mexico City house. So while in its simplicity, the local architecture is more compatible with modernism, as she wrote, the straightforward instinctive house is overlooked. So McCoy's, McCoy's observations echo Esther Bourne's premonitions of the evolution of the modern from the, from the ancient um, and the, the affinity between modernism's clean lines and pre-Columbian architecture of Mexico um, some years after the publication of her observations. So the night, the, August 1952 issue of Arts and Architecture is devoted to um, the University City of the National Autonomous University, the Ciudad Universitaria de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. And it features planning and large scale architectural projects that highlight their relation to existing modern and uh, pre-Columbian architecture in in Mexico's capital city. And so this was like the topos for the, for the new Mexican and the new Mexican culture. Um, and so this is, this, this is an image that, um, that shows uh, part of the school of engineering that was designed by Francisco Serrano, Luis Magregor and, and Fernando Pineda. So this discussion specifically points out the landscape's geological and historical significance as an expression of Mexicanidad, Mexican identity, and, and, it, and, it, and, it's, and an additional component of modernism. And in pointing out the 1951 University City's homage to the nearby Cuicuilco Pyramid, that we see in the distance, McCoy references, um, you know, uh, references not only you know Bourne's 1937 recognition of this archaeological site, but you know the site's um, um, significance, um, more broadly speaking, um, in the region. Uh, so, so in in a way, one way to look at it is that the is that um, there is some some shared um, interest in um, not only the the geology of this site, but um, also 
the the inf information that sort of the translation of some of these ideas that Bourne presented. And, and so Bourne's book can function as a blueprint for how to proceed with the city's development. And so th this last example, this last issue, the February 1964 cover of Arts and Architecture bears an odd resemblance to the Mexican folkways covers that we saw earlier in that um, they, they both they both look to indigenous culture, right? Indigenous, indigenous sorry, indigenous visual culture um, for, uh, for direction, right? And inspiration. So McCoy's three piece article for this issue includes a discussion of Mayan art and architecture, uh, discussion of Juan O'Gorman's mosaics, um, and, and, and a discussion of the exhibit, an exhibit at the Los Angeles County Museum at the time, it was called just the Los Angeles County Museum, um, not LACMA, on the ex exhibition titled, entitled 3,500 Years of Mexican Vision. So the article highlights indigenous um, pre-Columbian art, um, visual culture, and architecture of the Maya and its relation to contemporary cultural production. So in, in acknowledging historical precedent, McCoy emphasizes the connection between the land and its history and contemporary artistic production and pre-Columbian and modernist architecture and, and urbanism as well. So while modernism gleaned some lessons from the past, it built upon existing knowledge of architectural and urban forms that could enrich Mexico's built environment um, that would facilitate a recipro reciprocal dialogue in architecture's ongoing trajectory. So McCoy identifies the significance of Mayan architecture as food for thought for contemporary architects. So two forms stand out here, the, the Mexican truncated pyramid um, and the significance of walls um, as a place to symbolically and realistically record events and as enclosure against enemies. So in isolating architectural elements, McCoy could effectively link pre-Columbian and modern architecture while preserving the, the autonomy of each. And this also broadens definitions of um, modernism beyond the largely um, you know, European vocabulary limited to uh, reinforced concrete, glass, um, orthogonal constructions that feature sparsely furnished white finishes and bright interior interiors. And, and, and this would include regional and culturally, spe culturally specific materials, local materials, and colors and, and programmatic uh, distribution of spaces. So McCoy's work brings us back to the central themes of her predecessors. It's important in that she alone was commenting on Mexican modernism in any substantial way for a, a US architectural audience or audiences following World War II. And, and her interest in a country that seemed out of vogue in, in the United States at the time partly explains this, this disparity. Um, McCoy had the added of advantage of having time to reflect on the impact, the, the successes, the failures, and the challenges of, of um, Mexican modernism and, and the role that she and her predecessors played in introducing and popularizing these concepts um, to, to transnational audiences. So taken together, um, the work um, of these five women, so I'm wrap, starting to wrap it up, um, forms a continuum across uh, almost 50 years of Mexican architectural history. And it's characterized by transcending boundaries. Um, Let's see. Yeah. Um, what I want to, let me just show you this image here of um, 
some of the works that were on exhibit at what we call now LACMA, so the uh, Los Angeles County Museum, Los Angeles County Museum of Art. So McCoy, McCoy, Esther McCoy documents the sort of denouement of Mexican modernism through the rejection of uh, the rejection of um, strict modernist forms by Juan O'Gorman in his um, in this in his house of 1955 in favor of flowing curvilinear structures that are that are formed out of the living rock, the lava, the, what's called the Pedregal, which is uh, um, which is which actually forms forms part of um, the to, the to geography of Southern Mexico City. Um, and it's ornamented by pre-Columbian inspired mosaics. Okay, so um, just to uh, conclude, these women of architecture spoke from, it's important to, to note that they spoke from the perspective of, of they also were interested in speaking um, from the perspective of the poor, of peasants, of um, workers, um, women, you know, all key figures in um, the revolutionary ideology. So they recall, in some ways, they, they recall um, the soldaderas um, who sustained the revolution. Um, so all, although each of these women um, tour um, Brenner Modotti, born in McCoy, although each of them was um, independent, coming to Mexico City alone, um, they built their work on a network of um, personal, social, and professional relationships that comprised a network or a storehouse of information, sort of like our, you know, 21st century internet or Google, um, as um, Brenner's daughter actually observed. So they succeeded in advancing modernism because their industrious projects and resourcefulness optimized the media that was available to them after the revolution through private channels defined by women. And as members of a group emerging from mar marginalization, they were in a distinctive position to shape uh, modern architecture's role within the broader culture. So as a collective, they created a body of work on Mexican modernism that um, really can't be reproduced among any group of contemporary men. And again, this is a result of their comprehensive multidisciplinary transnational approach to Mexican modernism, actively confronting the challenges of tradition uh, versus the modern and of the native versus the foreign with the visual with the, with the visual culture as as the fulcrum. Um, and although their their in individual achievements were notable, um, their collective efforts introduced Mexico to the world and brought the world to Mexico. So I'll leave it there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Tina. Um, maybe unshare. We can do a little Q and A here. Um, I mean, you bring a. I mean, you touch on a bunch of subjects, right? And I haven't really wrapped my head around this notion of heritage and uh, indigenous culture that you're. I guess arguing or understanding um, was maybe more of a focus uh, that women in positions of, I wouldn't call it authority, but the ability to publicize and to position their ideas in the world were more interested than others at that time period. Um, and that was maybe part and parcel of the way in which Mexican identity has been represented in culture related to their modern agenda or whatever their agenda was. I guess what I'm trying to still understand is, because I think it's very contemporary, is kind of an interest in um, 
reclaiming or understanding the impact of indigenous uh, cultures, heritage, and tradition uh, in the face of technological, um, I don't know if it's progression. Um, and I kind of, you know, there seems to be is this, this conflict, which I think is interesting that you're bringing out about the folkloric or the folklore culture and how that yeah. gets represented or positioned or focused upon in order to make some, uh, it seems like, I don't know, you're, you use sometimes uh, uh, what I read is sarcasm, like exalting native vernaculars, like it seems to draw attention to something that maybe existed in a previous time period. There's a, there's a, there's a reason for it. I'm not entirely sure what that reasoning is. Um, why they're doing it, why they're positioning it, why they're making the argument, and how it works to support a particular agenda. Um, I guess my conflict in my mind is, is always when I think of like the drawing of what looks like mastabas or what is, of course, an image of step pyramids or earth mounds, right. uh, chi China, uh, North America, you know, all had that as an earlier tradition. And then if you look at just geometry, we all, I mean, universal kind of concepts of geometry are also embedded in some of this discussion. So I'm just, I, I'm just curious, like, where is the, where is the intended cachet of that time period? And then I guess, again, today, in making claim or recovering or trying to understand um, the value of indigenous heritage and tradition mapped onto a contemporary technology? I think um, it's important to point out that, that, um, that Anita Brenner, for instance, it was, uh, was an anthropologist, right? And, um, and that, um, they, she, she was, I think she was less interested in sort of reclaiming something from the past as acknowledging the presence of existing systems of indigenous knowledge. Um, and, and, and sort of correcting this notion that it is, you know, it is a heritage, um, but rather that it is an active that it's an you know an active um component of uh, of culture and um so i think it's it's less about mimicking you know in this um in this sort of uh cartoonish way which was which which was well understood, right, in, in, in Mexico City in the early 20th century, and, and more about um, uh, pointing out that, that in, indigenous cultures are alive and, and, and indigenous knowledge informs the modern. Um, perhaps, I'm not sure if this is um, adequately addressing your question, but I, I wanted to just note that I think that it's less about um, less about um, resolving, um, uh, you know, something from the past, and more about uh, acknowledging just uh, uh, diverse um, cultural forces. At, at work in, in Mexico um, um, as much in the early, I think that's what they were trying to do. So I guess, I guess that's part of what you were um, suggesting also. It's about um, not necessarily reclaiming it, but um, highlighting them, right? Giving acknowledgement, right? Um, uh, you know, um, what's interesting is that, um, um, well, this was, you know, this, this grew out of a, I, I just sort of, sort of lost my train of thought, but this, this grows out of, you know, of, of 
an ideological narrative, right? Um, that in some ways privileges, privileges, um, you know, the indigenous, right? In this um, revolutionary and post-revolutionary context, right? Um, but I think with this, this, you know, what these these women were trying to do was um, in just a few examples um, show more um, highlight some of the um, the problems that are that are inherent in the revolutionary ideological constructs. I guess I, I mean Does that I answer? understand. I it does and actually clarifies uh, as well just the understanding that indigenous uh, culture and understanding is ever present hasn't gone away and that's why it's still developing in the forms and language that we use today and it's not necessarily one of recouping a lost heritage the argument is the heritage is, is just ever present and built upon um, and then I kind of maybe want to jump into than the avoidance or the discourses surrounding Spanish colonial or what you call California colonial. And that there's maybe a specific interest in not presenting that style uh, within the modern vocabulary until you end up with someone like Irving Gill, who for some reason, I don't know, does it. Um, it's, it's not, there is an agenda there is yes. a recognition, right? That something represents or embodies a certain discourse while something else embodies a different discourse that you may or that you may or may not want to present or promote within your work. So this group were not promoting our choice. Right. And there's a reason for that. Yeah, sorry. I know much in the background. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, so I guess, I guess, because uh, what's happening, I guess I want to bring it to today is there was a, a definite interest in, in a POMA recovery of Spanish colonial imagery, um, not intended as such necessarily, but in architects trying to seek a study of heritage and culture uh, associated with, you know, Mexican, uh, society they're gonna turn to that imagery and right. represent it uh, maybe even more so than let's say you suggested mayan um what is the what is the cachet agenda behind doing that what does it mean when they do that how do you read it when it happens um i i think when 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 architects decide to adopt this sort of revivalist approach, you mean? Is, is yeah, revivalist under an yeah under an agenda of heritage, uh, heritage yeah, recovery, um, I suppose. Right. Okay. Um, I that's. Um, I mean, I understand the um, the impetus to do that, um, and. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I think that it's, there's a fine line between preservation and, um, you know, designing in this way. Um, I'm not sure if you were actually getting at preservation. Is that something that you were also thinking about? No. Okay. Right. right. So. Um, it's the same okay. agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, um, I think, you know, I, I, I think, it, I think it's, on a case by case basis, but you know, if you if you you know, I think you would have to um, start there. But um, I mean, I, I can see that it's it's to. I mean, I, I'm not for it. <laughs> That's the short answer, really, um, because um, because it doesn't actually acknowledge you know the the constant um, changes that occur on in in within culture right and um and it and it again it washes it's an attempt to wash over i'm not sure if that's what you're getting at but um you know, it's an attempt to wash over um um 
you know, the, let's say, inconvenient truths um, of, of, you know, of history. And that's why I find that so incredibly problematic. I'm not sure if you think that, um, so do you see that this, that's, you know, that um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make the link. I'm still not quite sure. Um, I'm just trying to wrap my head around also what you call the fol folkloric. So on another yeah. level, there's. See, I have, you know, that's an a, issue. Yeah. Oh, so the term folk art is being contested right now. I mean, it's interesting because there are, are entire museums that are dedicated to the promulgation of folk art, right? And, and it's being contested actually um, by, um, by, by, sorry. Um, folk art is now um, being problematized and, and, and there's an emphasis on, again, it's um, appropriation of indigenous knowledge as something, you know, other. Um, and, and, um, and so I, I don't know, sorry, I have a, child in the room. <laughs> Does your child want to but come onto the screen? He doesn't. He just wanted to show me some DVDs, I think, or something like that. He just really wanted to show me. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay. Good. There's, so, there's a... you were, so, so I uh, don't know that they, that these, um, that Francis Tor, for instance, was, you know, I don't think that she was, I don't know that, that she, how, um, she wasn't an anthropologist and, you know, and she was also living and working in the first half of the 20th century. Um, so, you know, I, I would say, you know, that this requires um, great care because, because, um, because it does, it does, um, it, it, because it, it, I don't want to say it tramples on the realm of indigenous knowledge, but you know, it it if it, it it you know there is there are issues of appropriation. That's really what I'm getting at. Um, Do you uh, see the question in the Q and A? Maybe I'll read it. I can't see. I, I just own... see, I see questions, I'm... but I don't see anything. I mean, it says I that... see where you wrote questions, but I don't see anything else. I'm going to read it. Um, okay. It's a point. I don't think it's a question, and we can okay. kind of debate it. Uh, this was when you were talking about modernism and specifically Le Cubizier and the use of uh, folkloric imagery mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to soften it, I would think. It said, mm -hmm. it, it would be germane to incorporate new understanding that Le Cubizier had autism spectrum disorder and other founding modernists, Gropius, Mies, Neutra have been respectively diagnosed with PTSD from World War II service. Mm -hmm. People with these disorders don't see the world or regulate normally, neurotypically. So it makes sense the Mexicans incorporated murals, folklore, indigenous items to the modern functionalism to make them feel more connected. And then it gives some sort of citation. So what do you what think is, about that? Okay, so I'm trying to connect um, the um, ASD with the Mexicans. Can I, can I, I would just like to, the, so I have there's someone. No, um, Go ahead. There's Go ahead. No, they, did, they, they did it anonymously, so I don't know who the person asked the question. Uh, um, my reading of it. Yeah, you go. Read that second part again. Um, uh, where I'm trying to like, see, I'm trying to make people the connection. People with these disorders don't see the world or regulate normally, but so, is that... or neurotypically. So, so it makes sense the Mexicans incorporated murals, folklore, and indigenous items to make modern functionalism more connected, to feel softer. It's an interesting Oh, argument. that is interesting. Okay, um, I don't know about that. No, I would say, okay, I, I, I um, acknowledge this. Um, first of all, I, 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 I'm not familiar with, um, but I understand, I mean, it makes sense that, um, you know, that they, that some of these architects would, you know, be suffering from PTSD. 
Um, I don't know, I haven't heard anything about, um, about look, Corb's ASD diagnosis. Um, I don't know that the, that ASD would necessarily um, result in designing that in, 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 in this, you know, modernist um, um, idiom. Um, and I don't know that, you know, you know, that um, being autistic, being autistic, you know, rather than, than having ASD, but, you know, if I'm, we're going to talk about like um, self-advocates, I mean, I, I'm not autistic as far as I know, <laughs> but I mean, if you're, I don't know that um, if you're autistic, I mean, I have two sons that are autistic, so <laughs> I'm trying to, like, um, if, if, if that would preclude, um, you know, including certain um, amenities in, in, a, in a building. You know, I don't know if, the, if you know, they're mutually exclusive. So I, I, I don't, the, the, I would say that the interest, oh, we have a question, Jose. <laughs> right, hello? You have, a, you have a question? Yeah, could you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, I mean, um, I thought it was kind of neat that we got a, I don't know, with your talk, an opportunity to kind of link to speakers that we've had so far. So um, we had a speaker and I'm going blank right now, but um, recently gave an example about how Rome kind of had a, a similar way of um, where like image making and um, producing this, this image of Rome and how it ought to be projected and how that sometimes didn't necessarily align with what existed in the, the city itself. And I'm kind of curious about what your position is on, or like how you view contemporary like relationship of, you know, you mentioned the, the way that nationalism was almost very tied to the way that um, the modernist like agenda in Mexico was um, projected as far as like um, the perception of the city goes. And I'm curious, like, how do you kind of view that in contemporary like um, arenas of the of nations, for example, and how they aim to kind of project themselves? Because I guess this kind of comes from a place of, for example, like I'm familiar with some countries and like to give an example of Guatemala, for example, there was a, a one point uh, last year where the president was kind of um, really calling on all the citizens to not report on like violent acts happening throughout the country because they wanted to really push this agenda of promoting tourism in the country, for example. Um, so again, just kind of curating the image of the of the country in a lot of ways. So I'm curious how you kind of, how you view that relationship, just because it was very clear in your examples, um, how it was very, um, they were very relevant to one another, kind of the portrayal of, this, of the city or the or the nation and the the government itself. Um, I think they're okay. I'm not. I'm not sure if I'm again. I'm going to do my best. I'm not sure if I'm addressing your question um, adequately. But um, the there is such a gap. Um, I would say um, there's there's such a gap between the reality on the ground and a, official policy, right? Um, you know, in Mexico, for instance, at the, oh, thank you. Um, thank you so much. He was learning about architecture. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that. Um, now he's picking his nose. Um, okay. All right. So, um, okay. So, um, <laughs> Sorry, there's such a gap. Okay, so in Mexico, for instance, and your example that that for, of of the Guatemalan president um, whitewashing, um, washing over violence, right, in his country to promote this image. It, I mean, that's that's so typical of um, you know what would happen in Mexico, right, <laughs> or many other countries, right. It's a nationalist agenda. That's the bottom line, and it's um, it's romanticized, and it's um, it doesn't reflect what it, what is occurring on the ground in ordinary 
you know, people's lives, you know, and ordinary residents' lives. Um, um, and so I'm not sure, but what, did I answer your question? I don't uh, know. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess I was just kind of more curious on how you see, I don't know, I kind of found it impactful and I was curious like how they, the examples you were giving, like how did they actually end up circulating the content they were making and so, yeah because you referenced that they were able to kind of get these sources of let's say the poor or the the folks who were not necessarily living in what would be projected as let's say the luxury of like the city or the state and i'm i'm finding that in contemporary kind of um let's say dissemination of media where we have an overwhelming amount of of let's say content or media but limited amount of attention to give how do you kind of see that gap today, for example? Well, um, I think there will always be some disparities. I mean, we see that here. I mean, um, you know, in, in the case, it's yours. I'm sorry. It arrived late yesterday was his birthday. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Did you get that? Um, Okay, so maybe we could just go. We have one more question and okay. then we probably should tie it up. And that's uh, Tyler. I think you can talk. Can you speak? Hi, Tyler. Let me see. Hi, Hi Tyler. Hello, here. Yeah. <laughs> Great to hear you. Hi, Steve. Um, Tyler. Yeah. I thought I, about I really... sending, I thought about sending you something and I just forgot. I mean, I wanted to, I was thinking about you today. Thank you for coming. Aw enjoyed it i especially liked um your inclusion of sj mccoy's notion that there's perhaps a sympathetic relationship between modernism and pre-columbian architecture this mm -hmm. idea of a kind of uh trans historical relationship is interesting it brings to mind the possibility of an inverse so perhaps an adversarial relationship mm -hmm. at least subtext of a mexico influx so I was really wondering if you could talk more about the potential of the folkloric, or I'd like to think of them more as, say, the totemic as mm -hmm. a potential architectural tool of resistance to systems of hegemony um, in a contemporary condition in which the expression of identity is so critical. I think architects yeah. and students of architecture need an expanded toolbox of kind of tools of resistance to hegemony, or at least ways to address it. Mm -hmm. And do you think the totemic or the folkloric um, could be that tool or one of the tools? Yeah, I think, I'm so glad you pointed that out. Um, so, um, so I think that's, that's part of, I, I would say part of, of, um, of Brenner's objectives uh, I think that that is also at some level. So she was interested in 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 this on a, on an from an anthropological standpoint, I would say, or in a journalistic one. Um, and and I think you know this is part of why um, there's such an interesting um, diverse range of um, of material covered in the work of these women. In the, in the guidebooks, for example, um, and, in, and in Mexican folkways, in, in, um, in the illustration of modernism um, as you know, something that can also have inscribed within it uh, at some level, um, a, a recognition of you know, the, the communities that this architecture serves. So you, you know, the, federal, the federal rural pu public schools um, were designed to, um, to, to serve, um, you know, indigenous people, poor people, um, but at the same time to enlist them, <laughs> to enlist them, um, in, in, you know, getting on board, um, with this nationalist, na nationalist, um, uh, agenda. I think that, you know, it's important to note that, I mean, it, it was very sort of one-sided, and I think this is kind of what Jose was getting at, very one-sided um, um, at the uh, official like policy level. 
So um, by the time, um, you know, architects and artists were enlisted to, um, to actually, you know, realize some of the, um, the nationalist edu like educational um, programs that, um, you know, I think that, the, I think that some of these these individuals, the architects and the designers, and had already kind of sifted through, um, you know, some of the problematic features of the of the nationalist agenda of their ideal ideological positions. I mean, because it's not as if you know things you know it's not as if things improved right <laughs> um, with the revolution, right? There was a protracted um, period of, of upheaval, of instability, of economic and, and political instability, which architects were keenly, and, and artists were keenly aware of. Um, um, so I, I'm not sure that I'm getting, a, um, addressing your, your question, but I think, you know, these, the, I think Brenner and, and Modotti and, and all these individuals were aware of this, um, certainly the ones that lived there, like, um, uh, Brenner and Born, excuse me, and and um, and Tor and um, Modotti, right? So, um, I mean, they were part of this circle, you know, this somewhat, you know, you know, they were part of this circle of 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 um, intellectual artistic figures, right? Um, that were, you know, who recognized the separations, right? Um, and, and even though they seem to be on board. At some level, because of their, you know, their privileged socioeconomic status, you know, I think they were aware of the, the, you know, they were they were aware of the the hegemony and were interested in, um, you know, in in in, in list, enlisting others to resist it, um, and I think that that's where the the I think that's where um, indigenous arts. Um, uh, factor in. I mean, you, I, you actually, I, I, I think that you really um, kind of, you, 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 you articulated this much better than I did, Tyler. So thank you. <laughs> um, did I, I answer I your question? So, so, so timely to, yes, yes. I, I think um, what's unseen in a lot of these discourses on identity is just the way in which it, um, in fact, is in kind of complicit see to power ideology things of that nature mm -hmm. so the revolution is perhaps of a placement less than a revolution the things um the symbols shifted but perhaps the systems of oppression and whatnot have not shifted as such and the way in which architecture and visual culture can be usually allied with that in a propagandistic fashion but the potential of the totemic or the folkloric is a way to at least in the subtext include um, the image of resistance to so the image of mm -hmm. uh, diverse voices and generate an architecture that is a kind of heterogeneous visual culture that can perhaps uh, inflect the desire of those that may not have the voice to mm -hmm. speak as such that mm -hmm. the re these revolutions were supposed to incite this mm -hmm. heterogeneous more egalitarian society which might not have come um, mm -hmm. Just the idea add of on to tools that. of resistance. Mm -hmm. I'm just, my only question would be when those imagery or those of let's say Mayan, Aztec, some other powerful hegemony, uh, it may not be a contemporary global hegemony, but it is one that is rooted in power, monarchy, um, incredible rituals of uh, control and mm -hmm. violence. So, mm -hmm. and I'm not just saying just Mayan and Aztec, I'm talking all kind of uh, history. So to only search for indigenous culture without maybe perusing the, the image itself and what it may have mm -hmm. represented in its time period seems um, seems problematic too. I know that's not what you're talking about when you use the word folkloric. I think that seems to imply uh, 
quilting or some kind of crafted yes. marginalia, you know, which is a different subject. But I, but I think the imagery does matter. Yeah, that's the, that's the, those are the terms. That's the term that Francis Tor used, right? Um, these are the terms. That's why, you know, I, I, I hesitate just to call it, you know, folk arts, right? And, but I, I want to also use the, the language that, that they used. And um, I appreciate, you know, the, the you know, pointing out that it's, you know, it's problematic. Um, um, the terms are problematic. Um, you know, and, and um, yeah, um, <laughs> but I did yeah, want to, I did, I did want to use that language. Thank you so much. No, I think it's, it's really useful language, actually. Um, thanks, Tyler. It was good to hear your voice. Tyler's one of our former grads who's a Princeton Mark at the moment, right? I assume it's going okay out there. You guys yeah. were in school even, yeah. Yeah, Are you still cool. there? You must still be there. I know they're all graduating, but you must still be there right now. Anyway, uh, thank you, Tina. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate it. And um, everybody for your um, presence and patience. It's all good. Thanks, um, everyone. Have a great rest of your evening. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everyone. No, thank you, Tina. I want to say thanks to my sister. <laughs> also. All right, bye.